When a Prime Minister takes office, there's no time limit, no fixed number of terms. Their leadership stretches out in front of us. Margaret Thatcher stood down after 11 years. Tony Blair served 10. Recently, though, we've had four Prime Ministers in six years, all of them Conservatives. David Cameron left Downing Street after the Brexit vote. Theresa May then had three years before Tory MPs intervened. It was the same for Boris Johnson. And in early September, it was the turn of Liz Truss. I'm honoured to take on this responsibility. Weeks later, at its annual conference, the Tory party chair said Liz Truss was its greatest asset to win the next election. She is the woman who will get Britain moving. That, though, is not going to happen anymore. Wow, one of the shortest lived premierships ever. Liz Truss's time is over, when it had only just begun. Hello, welcome. Well, this is unexpected. Not, of course, being here for a new series, looking at the biggest stories of the week. I just hadn't necessarily factored in doing our first episode on the day the Prime Minister resigns. But here we are, and across the next 30 minutes, this is the story of the fall of Liz Truss, because it's been quite a week. Hello, hi guys. Uh, We're probably still a few minutes away. Oh, are you? Yeah, okay. So we will reverse almost all the tax measures. Gone, gone, gone. A complete reversal. Gone, gone, gone. Clearly, trustonomics have gone. Gone, gone. He has locked her in the attic and simply taken over. No authority, no credibility. What is the point of her government? I will lead the Conservatives into the next general election. Definitely. Well, look, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that there's the opportunity to make any more mistakes. Well, no one wants to make mistakes. I have made mistakes. The Weller government has resigned. I really am getting fed up with this. Yeah. I saw members yeah. being physically manhandled. It's a shambles and a disgrace. There has been an element of confusion. There's quite a lot of turmoil in the party. What the cock eye down is going on? Liz Truss is currently meeting Sir Graham Brady. I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Think about everything that had already happened. The disastrous mini-budget, the markets forcing U-turn after U-turn, the Chancellor being sacked. Liz Truss was already under pressure, but Monday morning was a chance to reset. Dramatic news to start the week here at Westminster. Liz Truss had a new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. Any more U-turns? Yes, was the answer, because with feverish speculation about what the markets might do next, his immediate task was to calm them. We will reverse almost all the tax measures announced in the growth plan three weeks ago. This can reasonably be called the biggest U-turn in British economic history, or as one Tory MP put it... Well, her central prospectus has been... Uh, you know, consigned to the, uh, to the history books or to the recycling bin or whatever it may happen to be. The government's intervention, though, did serve its immediate purpose. The markets calmed. The politics, though, didn't. And as we headed into Monday afternoon, the opposition Labour Party had tabled a question for the government. But it was Cabinet Minister Penny Morden, not Liz Truss, who came to answer. The absence was noted. And all we know right now is, unless she tells us otherwise, that the Prime Minister is cowering under her desk and asking for it all to go away. Well, the Prime Minister is not uh, under a desk, as the... <laughs> she... Wherever she had been, Liz Truss then appeared. And we watched, and she watched, as Jeremy Hunt dismantled her policies. We remain completely committed to our mission to go for growth. But growth requires confidence and stability, which is why we are taking many difficult decisions starting today. Difficult decisions, said the Chancellor, 
And those decisions were made necessary in part by the mini budget and the hole that it had created in the public finances. And even after Jeremy Hunt had rode back on most of Liz Truss's tax cuts, the increased cost of borrowing, well, that meant the government still had to find 30 to 40 billion pounds in savings. To do that, to close this so-called black hole, well, the government was now turning to spending cuts. And to get a sense of whether those cuts could have been avoided, I went to see the BBC's economics editor, Faisal Islam. Hi, Faisal, all right? Hello, yeah, I'm busy? OK. You've okay. yeah, been a bit busy. Yeah. All right. Now, you're our economics editor, but before you did this job, you were Sky's political editor, so you can look at this story from the economic side, the political side as well. Is the push for cuts now fundamentally a, a political decision from the government or an economic one? It's necessity post a shock. And some of that shock has been of the government's own making. This shock has meant that interest rates have gone up higher mm -hmm. than they would have otherwise. It means the economy will be slower. It isn't everything. The fact that we are facing an energy shock from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the fact that across the world interest rates are going up, mm -hmm. that's also a factor that's worsened our borrowing and means that there's a sort of bridge to cross and will cause a squeeze. It's difficult to demarcate precisely whether it's sort of 50-50 or 20-80 or 80-20, but there's no doubt that many billions, half at least actually, of the 30 to 40 billion pound uh, hole that we're trying to fill with spending cuts, that that's come either from the direct decisions of the mini budget to cut taxes elsewhere, yeah. or from the economic impact, the unwanted economic impact of all this uncertainty. So let's consider the point we'd reached. The tax cuts were largely gone, the spending cuts were coming, and Liz Truss, well, she was pushing on. Her party chairman was telling us she's bringing the party together. And on Monday evening, she met a group of Tory MPs. The Times reported a relatively calm reception. One MP, though, told the BBC, it's the first time I've heard a corpse deliver its own eulogy. By this point, Number 10 had also suggested a BBC interview took place. And our political editor, Chris Mason, was asking the questions. Prime Minister, who is to blame for this mess? Well, first of all, I do want to accept responsibility and say sorry for the mistakes that have been made. Sorry, said Liz Truss. But as Chris noted afterwards... She knows. Her staff know, the dogs in the street know. She is seriously imperiled at the moment. Liz Truss insists she will lead the Conservatives into the next election, as despite calls from within her own party to quit as Prime Minister. Tuesday morning would offer no respite. Normally supported papers showed no mercy. The Sun called Liz Truss the ghost PM. The Mail declared in office, but not in power, and below it described a haunted Prime Minister. The polling was unremitting too. YouGov found that Liz Truss's approval rating was 10%, the lowest rating it had ever recorded for a Prime Minister. And you might look at that and think, those kind of numbers would be the end of the matter. Not so, said the Defence Minister, James Heapy. My sense is that there are dozens of colleagues in the Parliamentary Party who are gravely concerned over the way that the last few weeks have gone but they, like me, recognise that this is not the time to be changing leader again. Well, as we now know, it is the time for the Tories to be changing leader again. And even on Tuesday, some of its MPs seem to be hoping for that. The MP for High Peak, Robert Largan, shared a blog post titled The Dangers of Dumpster Fires. He went on, I firmly believe that we need to tackle dumpster fires when they occur, regardless of how messy or unappealing this may be. But, to borrow from CNN's Jake Tapper, this was becoming a hot mess inside a dumpster fire inside a train wreck, and no one seemed sure what to do. Meanwhile, the work of government went on, including new laws on protests. Climate activists selected a number of targets this week. A bridge, roads, a painting, Harrods, milk. They say the world's facing an existential crisis. 
but not everyone was convinced by the approach they saw. Childish, petty, pathetic vandalism. They've lost me forever, wrote LBC's Andrew Marr. The context here, though, is that climate change is happening. Global emissions are going up, so are temperatures. And this week, the death toll from flooding in Nigeria passed 600. The UN says climate change is responsible. The UN has also said this recently. The collective commitments of G20 governments are coming far too little and far too late. There is, of course, a debate about what to do about climate change and the merits of these protests. And facing all of this Morning. was the then Home Secretary, who laid out measures to restrict the protests. She also took aim. It's the coalition of chaos. It's the Guardian reading, to tofu eating, woke karate, dare I say, the anti-growth coalition that we have to thank for the disruption that we are seeing on our roads today. Sweater Braverman's bill to allow stricter policing passed the House of Commons. But that anti-tofu rhetoric would be her last contribution as Home Secretary. Which leads us to Wednesday. This is LBC News. Liz Truss is preparing for another difficult day in the... Out of the blue, the Home Secretary was gone. In theory, over sending an official document from a personal email. Her resignation letter, though went much further, advising Liz Trust that pretending we haven't made mistakes, carrying on as if everyone can't see that we've made them, and hoping that things will magically come right, is not serious politics. And whilst Wella Braverman appealed for serious politics, Conservative MP Bob Seeley spoke to LBC. Good afternoon to afternoon. you and your listeners. I mean, I actually just want to apologise. Uh, I really am getting fed up with this soap drama as much as your listeners are. Mr Seeley was fed up. His fellow Tory MP Grant Shapps had a new job. He's a former transport secretary. He voted Remain in the Brexit referendum. He's considered a moderate. And recently, he's been publicly criticising Liz Truss over her tax cuts. Now, he was in her cabinet. Evening, uh, everyone. Um, uh, look, obviously, it's um, been a turbulent time. Uh, Mr Shapps spoke to the press for a minute and 42 seconds. He repeatedly mentioned the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. At no point did he mention Liz Truss. The whole week was becoming a test of her leadership. And so, as Wednesday afternoon turned to evening, I wanted an assessment of how she'd done in the week so far. Few people are better plugged in to Tory MPs than The Daily Telegraph's Christopher Hope. His newsletter and podcast, as well as his WhatsApp, are full of MPs' thoughts. And I'd pulled together some clips from the week to show him. So I've decided that the basic rate of income tax will remain at 20%. Look at that mask on Liz Truss's face. Indefinitely. So this is Jeremy Hunt dismantling everything that Liz yeah. Truss has been saying. It's a political disembowelment I've never seen in 20 years covering British politics. The measures I've announced today... My teenage children would say, hashtag orcs. <laughs> Prime Minister, who is to blame for this mess? Well, first of all, I do want to accept responsibility and say sorry for the mistakes that have been made. Uh, so this was the I first time we'd heard the word sorry from yeah, Liz Truss. I would say about time. I mean, I've been saying in my journalism that the, that sorry word was required at the Tory party conference when she, all she said was, I get it, and that wasn't enough for many people. Then it was into Wednesday, into Prime Minister's questions, and of course all eyes were on how the Prime Minister would go. 45p tax cut, gone. Yeah. Corporation tax cut, gone. 20p tax cut, gone. Two-year energy freeze, gone. They enjoyed this, didn't they? Yeah, it's a good device, this. Economic credibility, gone. Normally, the rule of three says three things work, but there's so many U-turns, you have to keep going through about six or seven of them, and by the end, we forgot what he was saying. They're all gone. So why is she still here? Yeah. Then she stands up and and then tries to put it back on Starmer by quoting a figure from the past. I am a fighter and not a quitter. Peter Mandelson, Peter right? Mandelson, 2001. Yeah. I am a fighter and not a quitter. Last week, the Prime Minister stood there and promised absolutely no spending reductions. They all cheered. This week, the Chancellor announced a new wave of cuts. She's learned that you can't shortcut and go ahead of the experts. And it may be going back to a bit of the Brexit debate mm. when the Conservative Party used to be the party that was conserving 
institutions, but they seem to reinvent themselves since Brexit as one which doesn't trust institutions, doesn't trust experts. Can the Prime Minister perhaps turn to our Chancellor right now, get permission to make another U-turn and commit to raising the state pension at the rate of inflation? Yeah. Prime Minister. I honestly don't know what the Honourable Gentleman is talking about because... I would argue that's not a U-turn, that's just clarifying an uncertain position. We have been clear in our manifesto that we will maintain the triple lock and I am completely committed to it, so is the Chancellor. This though does come across now as a government which can't quite decide what it's doing. The Express said in its front page on Wednesday morning, don't do it, Prime Minister, and that seemed to me like a red line. And if they're saying don't do it, it was quite serious, and that probably triggered the response. Those headlines could have been avoided. Do you think this trust, trust minds what the Express is saying? Oh, I think so, yeah. yeah. I definitely think so. Does she mind what the Telegraph is saying? Surely she does. Well, they mind what we say too. This is the base. That note completes Prime Minister's questions. I'll Before let... you go, you've got your phone down there. I'm interested. How many messages have you got <laughs> from Tory MP? You don't have to tell me them, but I'm interested. How busy does your WhatsApp get? on a day like this, just in the it's short while we've been sitting with each it's other. It's normally pinging away. There it goes, it's, it's going off now. It's away already. Okay, ding, yeah. ding, ding, yeah, off it goes. I've not read that one out on air. Really? So I better go now. Nice to see you, thanks. Yes. Now, those messages coming into Christopher were bringing news of a further escalation. I think this might be it, he told me as we packed up. And that's because this is what had happened. There was a vote on the issue of fracking. But there was also confusion over whether there was a three-line whip, which would mean severe consequences for any Conservative MP who voted against the government. The Labour MP, Chris Bryant, tweeted this photo from the division lobby. I saw members yep. being physically manhandled yes. into another yes. lobby yes. and being bullied. Well, the business secretary, though, had a different version of events. This confusion on whether or not it was a confidence vote was something people needed a further conversation on. The government won that vote, but the Tory MP Ben Bradley was also posting this on TikTok. What on earth is going on in the House of Commons? It wasn't an easy question to answer. And then came the moment, live on BBC News, when for many it felt like the dam had broken. I'm livid. And, you know, I really shouldn't say this, but I hope all those people that put Liz Truss in number 10, I hope it was worth it. I hope it was worth it for the ministerial red box. I hope it was worth it to sit around the cabinet table because the damage they have done to our party is extraordinary. The Conservative MP, Johnny Mercer, retweeted that video, adding, F me, he's nailed it, every word. The Conservative MP, Maria Caulfield, wrote, Tonight, we are all Charles Walker. And the confusion deepened further after reports the Chief Whip and Deputy Whip were saying that they'd resigned. We were then told they hadn't. And the BBC's News at 10 wants to clear one thing up. Is this government functioning in any meaningful way? No. And this day when the government was self-combusting was also a day of profound worry for many. Figures show the cost of living is rising at the fastest rate for 40 years. It's life like for you at the moment, trying to, trying to get by. Very hard. It's very, very hard. And the rate of inflation is back in double figures. Risen to 10.1%. Pension, £140 a week. How do you live on that? We're currently going through a remortgaging process. Already it's becoming clear that the events of the last few weeks are having a massive impact on that. Higher food prices were mainly to blame. They were up. 14 and a half percent. The number of ch children turning up to school, not having breakfast, not having showers. It is the 14th month of relentlessly rising food prices. Energy bills may rise above £4,000 in April. I can't afford to put my heating on. I live on £250 per month. Every single morning at a set time, mm. I write down what's left on it That's to see how much I've used. It's all above my price range. It doesn't feel like living. Thursday brought the morning after the night before, and it began with calls for calm. 
Well, it's quite clear that quite, there's quite a lot of turmoil in the party, but what we all need to do is keep calm heads and work to resolve it, and I'm confident that we can do that. But the cracks were soon showing. Is Liz Truss the best that the Conservative Party has, the best person the Conservative Party can offer to be Prime Minister today? Liz Truss uh, is uh, the Prime Minister because our uh, system of selection... I understand why uh, she's the Prime Minister, I'm her, asking and we you. Continue, we continue to support her. And through the morning, the number of MPs calling for Liz Truss to go was increasing. Some were even releasing letters on social media. Sky News began keeping an on-screen tally. And one minister told Sky, we live day by day. Who am I kidding? Actually, we live hour by hour. The party has had a collective breakdown. And as MPs gathered in the House of Commons on Thursday morning, Labour tabled an urgent question about Suella Braverman's resignation. Yvette Cooper had this summary of events. The Home Secretary's been sacked, the Chancellor sacked, the Chief Whip sacked and then unsacked, and the unedifying scenes of Conservative MPs last night fighting like rats in a sack. This is a disgrace. Yvette Cooper wasn't done there. She also had this question. To quote the former Home Secretary, this is indeed a total coalition of chaos. Why should the country have to put up with this for a single extra day? Yeah. It wouldn't have to because shortly after lunchtime, Sir Graham Brady, who represents Tory MPs, walked into Downing Street. He was there for a meeting requested by Liz Truss. And from that point, things moved quickly. At 1.20 p.m., my colleague Nick Airdley had this update. We're going to hear from the Prime Minister in the next 10 minutes, Ben. No word yet from number 10 about what exactly she is going to say. The podium was out. And just after half past one, the moment came. I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. It was over. And for a moment, we all caught our breath. And just before we get into who might come next after Liz Truss, I just want to pause and consider everything that we've seen this week with the help of Nick Robinson. How much is this to do with the actions of one person? It starts with Liz Truss. There's no doubt about that, Ross. Why? She did something I've never seen a politician do before. When you win, you normally bring in your opponents. You bring in the people who ran against you. You try to create a broad church. She did the opposite. She excluded them all. You normally listen to the expert advice, particularly on economics. She sacked the head of the Treasury, the top official at the Treasury. She ignored the Bank of England. She ignored the watchdog that's called the Office for Budget Responsibility, and she ploughed ahead with policies that she must have known that they would warn her against. OK, well, that's Liz Truss, but it's tempting as we listen to all the things that she's done to create a narrative that this is really just her doing. But how much do we need to look beyond her, in particular to her party? We've got to look much further back. Why have we had so many prime ministers in such a short period of time? David Cameron, forced by Brexit supporters to have a referendum he didn't want to have, forced, he felt, to resign when he lost that referendum. Theresa May forced to resign because she didn't deliver a Brexit deal that people liked. Boris Johnson forced to resign largely because of his own behaviour. If you don't understand that each of those resignations forced from office creates anger, creates people who resent what's happened before, creates arguments about who's right and who's wrong, you don't understand the poison that is running through the modern Conservative Party. Well, you mentioned Boris Johnson. Let's go back to his victory, election victory in 2019. There was lots of commentary at the time saying he had profoundly reshaped the Conservative Party. This was him creating something new. Does that exist anymore? Well, that is absolutely part of the argument. In other words, that Boris Johnson had added to the traditional southern middle class support, working class, northern, so-called in the jargon, red wallers. They wanted more investment in their towns. They wanted sometimes higher public spending. Now, no one else before Boris Johnson had created quite that coalition. No one at the moment looks like sustaining that coalition. But it means inside Parliament, 
There are people who see themselves as speaking up for this or that town in the North England, rowing with people who represent the traditional Tory base in the South. Now, Nick, you and I in our different ways, uh, we try and explain the news, particularly politics, to our listeners and viewers. And increasingly when it comes to the Conservative Party, when people say, well, what does the Conservative Party represent? I find it increasingly hard to know what to say. Well, I think that's right, because you've got some who look back and older viewers and listeners of this will remember Margaret Thatcher. They've got an idea of what they think. You've got others who are new to the Tory party because of Brexit. They came in because of Boris Johnson and Brexit. They've got very, very different views of the world. And then you get some traditional Tories who were never Brexiteers and never great fans of Margaret Thatcher either, who have a much, if you like, steadier, low-key view of conservatism. And that's why it's so difficult for any one individual to build a coalition and bring them together. And that, perhaps, is what leads us to explaining why we've suddenly got so many prime ministers in such a short space of time. Absolutely. That's why it's happening. That's why it's so difficult for the Tories to agree. And there's another reason, too, of course, which is the fundamental reason that people watching this care. We've all got poorer as a country. Instead of getting much richer as a country, when it's then easy to give some money to the health service and some money to tax cuts and some money for defence, for example, when you have to make difficult choices, partly because of the banking crisis back in 2008, partly because we've got less trade after Brexit and we haven't yet seen the benefits that the Brexiteers have promised, partly if the world is just a poorer place than the war in Ukraine now, there's less to go round, there's more arguments to have, because somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. Thanks for making time for us, Nick. Appreciate it. It's always good to talk. And now the question is, who's next? Well, first of all, we know who's not standing. Michael Gove says he's out, so does Chancellor Jeremy Hunt and Foreign Secretary James Cleverley. Penny Morden, well, she says she's in, and we're watching out for Rishi Sunak, but there's someone else we need to talk about too. Boris Johnson, the man who Liz Truss replaced. He's on holiday in the Dominican Republic, but look at this. The Times is reporting he's taking soundings about standing. We'll see. The winner will be announced next Friday. Meanwhile, Labour says it's time for a general election. And as we look forward, let's also look back to August, to the Holiday Inn in Norwich. It's early evening and Liz Truss is making her pitch to Tory party members. I'm somebody who is prepared to take action, to do what it takes to fix the issues our country has. The members were persuaded. Her campaign led to Downing Street. She was prime minister. Two days later, the queen died. Politics paused, but it would return with a vengeance. The mini budget, the U-turns, the resignations, the farce and confusion, the humiliation, of seeing her own government dismantling her ideas. It was all too much. This trust had lost control. And just like that, she was gone. Goodbye.